so I am in constant um, communication with a couple of people in my life. And in no particular order, it is my husband, it is my mom, and it, it is these gentlemen. These are my older son's football coaches. Do they not look like football coaches? <laughs> when I was asked to do this speech, I thought I have to actually get pictures of my boys' coaches to share with you all. I mean, look at them. They're adorable. They're adorable. And they almost yell as, as loudly at my son as I do. They're almost as good at it. But the reason that my son is playing football is because um, he came to us when he was starting seventh grade and said, I want to play football. And his father said, no way. Don't want to do it. I don't want you to do it. I was a little bit on the fence, but it was really intense coming from his dad. So we said, all right, Elijah, if you want to play football, you need to give us a persuasion paper that talks about um, concussions, that talks about the reasons you want to play. Um, we need to know why. Why do you want to do this? Why are we going to be taking you to these practices? What's going on? He wrote the paper. It was a very long paper. Um, and the last page actually was particularly irritating because the last page said, why you have no credibility. And the last page was about the fact that his father and I, and this is true, are both martial artists and my husband drives too fast. So he thought that we were doing way too much at-risk activities to have credibility about stopping him from playing football. Um, we agreed to let him play. But we agreed to let him play not only because he had done his research, but also because I met these gentlemen. And although they look really tough, and they are tough, and they do yell at my children, at my child, um, they are outstanding gentlemen. They are men of honor. I trust them with the emotional welfare of my child. My child wants to work hard for them. They do not humiliate the boys on the team. The boys work so hard for each other. And it is really the best of what team sports can be. It is also the case that my child loves to be at the bottom of the pack of boys all over him. And it gives him this incredible outlet. Now, that is only until November. In November, I switch, and I have two sons. Now, my younger one is 11. And then from November to June, I get to hang out with these dudes a lot. These are my basketball coaches. So there, we actually asked them to be tougher. For, I took these pictures for you all. And here's them trying to be tougher, OK? <laughs> Um, so here's, the, here's, here's these men that I spend a tremendous amount of time with. And the reason that I so value these men is that really they have provided such guidance for my sons. And you know, you have to have a good relationship with people like this because they're going to be asking you to get up and be like hours away from your house at 8 o'clock in the morning, with a smile on your face, ready to be enthusiastic for the rest of the day. So you, it's, for me, learning how important these relationships were was actually, even though I had been a competitive athlete in high school and college my, my entire life until through college, that these relationships as a parent um, were really astounding to me as I learned how much time we were going to be spending together and how I was going to depend on them to help me raise my sons. Now, it is also the case, like many parents, that I have had the experience, in my case it was with an AAU basketball um, coach, who absolutely believed that humiliating children was absolutely the way to motivate them. Um, my older son was in sixth grade at the time. He's really tall, and so he got focused on um, by that program. And, any kind of challenge that I, want, that I wanted to talk to the coach about not humiliating the children as a way to motivate them, um, may, the way in which he responded to me was that he felt that I was an over-involved, micromanaging, coddling mother, and that if I wanted an elite athlete, he was going to have to get used to being humiliated and that the coach could do whatever he wanted to him. As someone who's worked with boys and girls for 20 years, what I know, and I don't have to be a mother to know this, is that the relationships that these children have with their coaches is beyond what we can sometimes put to words. That these boys, in my case, are going to look to these men and say, 
I want to do whatever I can for you. I will play injured. I will not talk about the fact that I'm feeling a little fuzzy because I want to please you so badly because it's so important to me because I want you to be proud of me. That relationship is sacred. So as a parent, my responsibility is to be able to identify who are the adults that are going to be able to do this for my, for my boys. So that AAU coach was not the person. And it was a really important moment for my husband and I about were we going to withdraw my child from this program. We were getting a lot of pressure not to. We decided to because it was so important that this relationship be really valuable. So we've gone through the experiences of the positive people in our lives um, and the ones that are not so great. Now, I believe that we are in a really critical juncture here because there are men like my football coaches and my basketball coaches who are transforming these boys' lives and are showing them how to be athletes but also how to be confident, strong men who are honorable. And that just by being with them, they are learning to be the kind of men that will contribute overall to our society in really positive ways. But there is enough. Let's not let joke, our, joke ourselves about this. There are still a lot of coaches and a lot of parents who absolutely believe the things I was hearing from the AAU coach. So we really are at a moment where there has to be a call of action. Because it's not, because what we've been hearing today is it, about, it is about the emotional and physical health of our children. So that's what this is, is a call to action to really transform and advocate for our children and for our communities in incredibly productive ways. Because here's the problem. As an athlete and having two children that are athletes, it is absolutely clear that athletics provides the most incredible foundation to create and sustain the social contract and teach it to young people. You learn how to get through failure. You learn to pick yourself back up. You learn that adults will be there for you and that they will support you through the rough times. They will hold you accountable in the best of ways. That is one way that sports can happen. It is also the case just as much that sports can be a total exercise of abuse of power and that young people will learn to say nothing in the face of cruelty if from, the, from, the, from the coach, from the other kids, from the parents. So we often talk about community and team spirit. Community, we usually assume, is a positive thing, that we all get along. Well, we don't, right? Conflict is inevitable. Even under the best of circumstances, conflict is inevitable, and abuse of power is pretty inevitable, too. So beyond these you know, sort of larger meanings and larger words, how do we concretely do this? How do we do it so it makes a difference? Well, here are my best suggestions. My best suggestions are that you go to young people themselves. So one of the things that I did in the last couple of years, and I'm asking you all to think about how you do it in your own jurisdiction of what you do, right? From the students in the room, to the doctors, to the parents, to with clinicians, what, do you, what can you concretely do? So I'm going to show you what I did in the last year. I wrote this book for high school boys in coordination with 200 high school boys, The Guide, Managing Douchebags, Recruiting Wingmen, and Attracting Who You Want. Um, it was done in conjunction with the boys' book that I had done for adults, Masterminds and Wingmen, but The Guide is free. It is an ebook that is free for boys to download so that they can have something in their pocket on their phones, and when they have problems, that they can search for it and not look like they're asking for help. So, you know, if somebody is turned on you, you go to page 75. If your coach um, is really angry at you, go to page 124. If there's somebody on your team who's making some other kid's life miserable, go to page 285. Because, of course, we couldn't have a guide for boys without really getting into the nitty-gritty of what it is to be an adolescent male growing up today. Here's another specific one that we talked about. As a freshman, as a ninth grader, when you're really good, the other part of this is, is if you're really good at athletics, there are some boys who are really good at young ages who also look much older than they are because they go through puberty faster. They're bigger. They look like men at 14. 
Well, parents can get so excited, understandably, right? Because it's like, my kid is so awesome. They're so good at the sport. I don't know where they got it from. I think it was my side of the family. You're super psyched about this. But what parents don't realize is that when they have a 14-year-old child who is really good at something, and then we're going to put him directly into varsity, it means that a 14-year-old boy is now socializing with 18-year-old men. The same with girls. And the boys, by the way, are going to be extremely reluctant to tell their parents about what is going on in the locker room if there is an abuse of power, because they're worried that they, that there's, that they will be removed from the team, that their parents will freak out, they don't know what to do. They don't want to disappoint their parents, they can take it. Meanwhile, the parents are so proud of their athletically able boy that they don't see the social dynamics that they are consistently putting their son in. So that's why we wrote this. The boys and I wrote this for the reason that, the, that boys around the country would be able to have something that they could look to as a resource. So I'm asking you today about what are the things that you can concretely do to be able to allow children to, to nourish and maintain the relationships that they have with adults that are where you are exercising authority and leadership in positive ways. So here are my concrete examples for parents and for coaches that if we did this as a whole, that I think we could really shift the way that we have the conversations about athletics and that we could challenge the attitude successfully of that AAU coach that I was dealing with and how, what that represented. So for parents, we are driving kids around a lot in cars to these games all over the place, right? There are parents who want to go to every single game no matter how far away it is. That is not me. I am not that parent. But there are parents who do that. I'm not talking about those parents. I'm talking about the parents who are like, I've got three children and they're all going to different games, so we have to carpool. You got to take my kids. I'll pick them up on the way back. So you are driving four kids to, to their soccer, football, lacrosse, whatever game. And you're driving and you hear in the back of the car some, uh, one of the kids say something like, don't be gay, don't be retarded. And you, as the parent, oftentimes parents do nothing in those situations. Their stomachs get all, some of their stomachs sometimes get weird, but then what happens is that usually their child is sitting next to them, right, in the front seat, and the child is telepathically communicating to the parent, like, don't you dare say anything, right? And you don't want to do this because you think that your child will socially suffer if you speak out. So you don't say anything. And in that moment, the parent has absolutely condoned and reinforced the power dynamics of the children and the degradation of, of people based on what? It doesn't matter. It's, you know, that's okay, doesn't matter. Here's what I want parents to do instead. What I want parents to do instead is I want them to pull the car over totally disregarding the evil stares of their child, um, them taking their seatbelt off, so they look at all of the children. So the, parent, so the kid is like, your son, your daughter's like, I cannot believe you're doing this, please stop doing this, right? You totally ignore it. You turn to the children and you say, we are not using the word gay to put people down. Are we good? We don't have to show a documentary. We do not have to be all scary mom. You just say, are we good? Most of the time, kids are going to go like, okay, crazy woman. And you're right, they don't say it. They'll just think it. And then you go, great, excellent. Put your seatbelt back on. You keep going. But if you get a kid who argues with you, Ms. Wiseman, Rosalind, doesn't matter. It's just what you say. You say, as a parent, you're not going to use the word gay to put somebody down. If you'd like to talk to your parents about this, please do so. Because I actually think that you should call the parent uh, um, and say, and call all the parents that when you get home, not while you're driving, and say, hey, just wanted you to know what happened when I was driving the kids to practice today. They made a racist joke. They said something homophobic. They said something sexist. And I called them out on it. So if you want to talk about it, I just, you know, I'm glad to do it. I just wanted you to know. Now, it's important to do that because it's important that our parents know that this is happening. Because my experience also is, is that most parents, especially most white parents, are completely in denial about the racist, sexist language that our children regularly say. They cannot believe it because they told their children that people are equal and there should be no racism and that's the end of that story. Okay? It is our absolute responsibility to use the opportunities of these hours that we have in the car 
that when they come up, and unfortunately they're probably going to come up, that we are going to speak truth to power in that moment. Now, the other part is, is that your child is going to get really mad at you. That's okay in that moment because you're speaking up and doing a values declaration in that moment. This is what I stand for. This is how I, how I will speak out. Number two for parents is you're in the car alone with your child. Now this I have learned, I learned so much from these boys for this book, and it helped me with my own experience with my own children. So when they get into the car after a game, when your child gets into the car, there seems to be an uncontrollable problem that parents have where we have to talk as soon as they get into the car. We have to discuss the game. We have to decompress it. We have to figure out what they learned, all of that stuff. I would strongly suggest, and this is about the relationships that we have with children and coaches, is that I would strongly suggest that when your kid comes in, gets into the car, especially after a loss, that you just let them sit. They're probably going to put the, you know, the car seat down, close their eyes, totally chill out for as long as they need to. Let them sit and be quiet. Number three is about freaking out. And again, I don't think I would have figured this out except for the boys talking to me in the last couple of years. I saw a parent on a, on the field, on a football field at the end of a game rush up to one of those big football dudes, one of my football coaches. They're not small. I don't know if I would do that. Rush up to the, to the, um, to the coach and start screaming at him. A few minutes later, I didn't even realize what had happened. I didn't make this connection, was that there was a boy who was crying with two boys who were talking to him really quietly, but obviously trying, he was, they were obviously trying to console him. That kid was that mother's son. And as we walked away, what I realized, and then what I talked to the boys about when I was doing this book in Masterminds, was that parents who get into this mama bear, daddy bear thing that they get very proud of, like, I'm going to go save my child from this horrible thing that's happened, like they're not getting enough you know, playing time, something really bad happened, I'm really, really angry at the coach, I'm going to go right up there and deal with this problem. That when they freak out to the coach in that moment, what they are actually doing is they are reinforcing the idea in the child's head to never talk to that parent again about anything. And why would they? If they're going to send, if a parent is going to go and yell and scream, and a child looks at that, the only thing the child gets away from that, takes away from that is, I can't trust my parent to competently handle things because they totally blow things out of proportion. I am not going to talk to them about the problems that I'm having. So ironically, this a passion and this motivation to save your child and help your child, that the biggest thing it does is it says to your child, don't talk to me because you cannot trust me. I think it makes sense. I think what the kids are saying makes sense about this. So the most important thing that we have to do is when we have this feeling of, I have to go kill someone because somebody is messing with my child, is that you go, oh yeah, I'm having this feeling. This is an understandable feeling. But if I act on this feeling, like a crazy person, I'm not being the adult and the parent that my child deserves. That is our responsibility. One of the things that oftentimes we talk about in, with teenagers is that, you know, and t adults are starting to say this to teenagers, oh, you know, your brains don't really develop until you're 25, right? Okay, well, we have to be really careful about that because adults do not have the market cornered on emotional maturity. So kids are looking at us like, uh, okay, sure, but what's your excuse, right? So let, we got to be careful about how we use this brain development, um, that these new insights that we have, which are fascinating, but be careful about the way that we are marketing that idea to the people that we are talking about. So we have to manage ourselves. If we do not manage ourselves, our children will not rely on us as ethical leaders. If you are a parent and you are in team sports, or actually individual sports as well, it is probable that you will have the experience of watching a parent completely lose it. The majority of parents, when that happens, get totally like, whoa, look, they're losing their minds over there, and then we gossip about it in the parking lots afterwards or during the breaks, but we don't do anything. When we don't do anything, we are contributing to the problem. 
When we gossip in the parking lot but don't handle it, we are contributing to the problem. So when we see parents who are roll, you know, going off, then we have to do something. Every league has protocols about how this is going to happen. At the very least, you write a short little note, like a little tiny little piece of paper, you can borrow one, someone's going to have one, that says, that, you know, par parent in the blue shirt is losing their mind, please help. Fold it, give it, to the give it to the ref during a break. If you know the parent and you feel physically safe with this person, it is incumbent upon the you as the adult to say to the parent, hey, this is really uncomfortable for me, but can we talk for a second about what's going on with you, with the court? Because it's really coming across like you are putting the kids down. I know you don't want to do that. So can we talk about this, please? If we don't do things like that, we need to understand and acknowledge and admit that we are hypocritical adults because we are asking children to do things regularly that we are not willing to do ourselves. We regularly tell children to stand up to bullies. It happens all the time. Adults are always telling kids stand up to bullies. If we don't do it, we have no credibility. We are not willing to do things that we regularly ask children who apparently have less developed brains than we do to go do something incredibly difficult. And they actually have a lot less power than we do. So we must do it. But we must do it upholding the dignity of the parent that we're speaking to, and we must uh, uphold the dignity of ourselves. For coaches, we have to begin and continue to have conversations that are incredibly uncomfortable. And what that means is you have a group of kids, I don't care if they're boys or girls, and you sit down and say, I know I'm here to teach you whatever the sport is. I get it. But also what I'm here to do is that on this team, we will not be using racist jokes. We will not be saying rape jokes, which is a pretty constant and consistent experience that I have as someone who works with middle school boys, that about seventh grade, you start hearing, the kids start hearing those jokes on the team. So as the coach, you begin the season by saying, we are here to be a team, and what a team means to me is that we will not use and say those kinds of jokes. We will not laugh along, even if we are uncomfortable. We will speak out. That is part of you being a part of this team. I do not use that language with you, not because it's not the right thing to do, because, but it is. It is because I believe that that is my absolute responsibility to you, is to create a team that is based on those values. So gentlemen, ladies, it's not happening. And if it does happen on this team, somebody has a slip up, Here's what I would like for you to do if you hear it from one, of your, from one of your fellow players. I want you to say, we don't do this on this team. If it's a pattern, if you get blown off, you come to me. I will not humiliate any player for violating a rule, but we will hold each other accountable. It also means that when, co when coaches make mistakes, you know, we can have a bad day. I can yell and scream at my children. I can make, you know, big mistakes, that what young people need is they need to see the role modeling specifically, not just in generalities, but specifically about holding oneself accountable when you've done wrong. So when a coach has done something wrong, that you don't say, oh, you know, people are human, but you say to your team, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Yesterday I was over the line. What if, you make a you know, what if you make the mistake of teasing a kid? This happens all the time as a teacher or a coach. It's really easy. You say a joke, you make a joke, because joking is really common. It's one of the best things about coaching. You say something, and you see the kid sort of go like this, and you sink in your gut. I went over the line. I teased him about something that just wasn't right. I made a comment about how short he was, right? If you're dealing with middle school boys, that kind of stuff can be really, really sensitive. So you go to the kid privately, and you say, hey, I want to talk to you about something. I've been thinking about that thing I said yesterday, and I was wrong. I was over the line. Now, kids are probably going to say, that's okay, don't worry about it, coach, don't worry. Because that's what kids have to say, right? It's a thing of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe my coach is saying this to me. I have to tell you from what I know from young people is that when adults do that, parents and coaches, when they do that and teachers do that, it is transformational to young people to say, wow, I have an adult who actually is saying I'm sorry. And the authority that that adult has in that moment transcends any game strategy that you're ever going to teach a kid. So these moments are transformational. They mean something. It is how we get to the place where sports rises above whatever sport you're playing. 
And the last thing I want coaches to think about is when you see another coach running off the rails and that we also have to hold each other accountable in the same way. In the same way that I'm talking about parents reaching out to each other, that they say, hey, you know, yesterday I saw you at that tournament, last week I saw you at that tournament, and things were rough. I know, like, you were, like, I heard you saying to the kids, I heard you saying to the boys, don't run like little girls, don't cry like little girls. That's not the way you want to coach, right? Can we talk about this? Because at the very least, what you have to show is that, 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 the, that the standard is not that anymore. Because honest to goodness, the biggest hang-up I think that we have to having sports be what we want it to be are not the kids, it's us. It's the adults who don't want to confront each other and don't know how to confront each other in ways where we can make it better. So if we say what we don't like, but we do it in a way that respects the privacy and the integrity and the dignity of the person that we're speaking to, if we're clear about what we stand for and say, this is just the way it came across, and I know, you know it's uncomfortable for me to talk to you about, but this is really important to me, and I hope it would be important to you, that we get to a place where adults are acting like adults and we are supporting each other. Now, I want to leave you with a story that I think encapsulates all of this. When I was, when I, um, last week when I was preparing for this speech, I was given a great gift as parenting sometimes does. And my gift was that I got an email last Tuesday from my older son's principal. And my older son's principal was telling me that my son had worn um, inappropriate and against the dress code socks to school. Now, you might think that socks, like who cares about socks, right? These socks were a problem. I had told my child that he was not allowed to wear those socks to school, so he shouldn't have been wearing them anyway. But these socks had hands with middle fingers up all over the socks. He had been given them as a gag gift by my, my like, aunt, okay? But he was specifically told he could not wear those socks by me, his mother, who is not really very wimpy, right? I was clear. And I was particularly clear, and I'd been recently clear, because my child, on the first day of school, had worn a sort of political t-shirt. And it was a new principal. And the new principal, instead of telling him to turn the shirt inside out, asked him what it meant to him. It was an excellent, excellent question. Wonderful thing to do. Four to three days later, my child wears another sort of political, interesting shirt. And I live in Colorado, and so these things can get very nerve-wracking for people very easily. Uh, principal asked him again, tell me about that shirt. My son comes home, tells me, isn't it amazing? The principal didn't ask me to turn it around. I said, that sounds like a good principal to me. So that means that you're not going to wear those socks, because I, I know him. Last Tuesday, he wore the socks. And somehow I didn't pay attention as he was walking out the door. And that, of course, was also back to school night. I was very clear about these socks. Here's what I decided to do. I remembered that Coach Tim, that was one of the coaches back there, my football coach, has always said to me, you know, if you ever have any problems with your kids about not doing homework or anything like that, just give me a call. I thought, well, he didn't say socks, but I'm taking advantage of this. And I called Coach Tim, and I said, Coach Tim, I have a problem. Um, my son is disrespecting me about these socks. And although it's sort of funny, like, ha-ha, it's obnoxious. And I told him not to, and he's pushing the limits, and I need your help. Coach Tim said, I got it. He said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to Elijah on his own. I'm going to talk to him about his responsibilities to the family. I'm going to talk to him about responsibilities that, of him as growing into being a man. Then I'm going to have the team run with Elijah for, because Elijah had a discipline problem at school, but I am not going to tell the team what happened because I don't want to humiliate, I don't want to embarrass him. And I said, Coach Tim, this is an excellent, excellent idea. I totally support this idea. Thank you very much. And we sort of laughed about having this child um, in my life. And, um, and he ran. Now, here's the thing about parenting. When I got off the phone, and this is not wonderful for me to say, but I'm human, was I was, like, delighted. I got off the phone. My husband was in the room with me, and I was like, yes! <laughs> Elijah's going to run. Yes! 
<laughs> and then I had my mature, that was, a, that was an immature private moment. <laughs> Maturely, what I just decided to do, and, I, and, this is, and this is actually quite serious, is that I didn't ask Elijah about it. I didn't need to gloat as a parent. So, how was practice? Did you run today? It was tempting, but I didn't do it because I had faith in Coach Tim that he was going to hold my child accountable in the right way. Now, that's what community really is because I think as parents, we oftentimes feel really isolated. And when we have these conflicts with each other, we can feel even more isolated. And so together, with the experience of Coach Tim with me, not saying to Coach Tim, I can't control my child, I need you to do it for me. Sometimes parents do have that experience, and that can be helpful. But ideally, the experience of you respect your parent. And part of the respect that you have of your parent is that they have a support system that will consistently enforce the community and family values. And that in the process, you're going to make mistakes as a child, because we do, but that we will hold you accountable in a way that upholds your dignity, but also really shows you not just that you have personal rights of, for example, freedom of expression with obnoxious socks, but that you also have responsibilities to your community and that the people that love you and support you are going to have you learn and reflect on what that means on a day-to-day -day basis. And as you do that, in our case, that you will turn into a boy and a young man and a man that is confident, strong, that is all of the things that we want for our boys to be able to come into their own, but also with a bedrock understanding of their responsibilities to other people and that they are not above anybody else. Thank you.